invite you now to take your Bible, please, and turn with me to the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 9 this morning. The Gospel of Matthew, chapter 9, is where we want to go. And this is our second week together in this new series, Four Gospels, One Gospel. Last week we looked at the Gospel of Mark, and today we are going to think together about the Gospel according to Matthew. And I took the title of this series from a line by the church father Augustine, who said when he was writing on the gospel according to John, he said in the four gospels, or better in the four books of the one gospel. He corrects himself. Why? He's trying to say something here. These aren't four different biographies about Jesus' life. There's only one gospel message, but there are four different witnesses to the one same message. So while there are four books we call the Gospels, there's only one Gospel. These are four witnesses to that one story. So we said last week these are technically not biographies. The word biography, of course, bios, the Greek word for life, graphe, for writing. These are not life stories of Jesus, meaning they're not trying to tell us every detail about Jesus, but they are trying to tell us something about him. In particular, each writer to the one gospel message, they're being very specific. So, they're much more comprehensive than a biography, but also at the same time, much more selective than a biography. And we looked at John 21, how John, at the end of his gospel, he says that he is a disciple who's bearing witness and is writing this gospel record. And he says, there are many other things which Jesus did, which if they were written one after the other, I suppose not even the world itself could contain all the books that would be written. In other words, Jesus did many more miracles, many more signs, preached many more sermons than what John records. And he's being selective in what he tells us. The other signs are beyond the scope. He's an eyewitness to what he's telling you, But there's a lot more that could be said. But there's a reason why he's only telling you these particular things. And he gets more explicit about his reason a little later. We didn't see this one last week. But he says in the the previous chapter, These are written, why? That you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. So he's saying, look, I could have told you a lot more. I'm an eyewitness. There's other witnesses. But here's the thing. This is why these particular ones are arranged here in this gospel. So what are the gospels? We said that they are historical narratives. They're real literal accounts that happened, but they have theological concern. They are technically a theological biography. Four presentations give us a more clear picture of who Jesus is, a very compelling one, but they're not contradictory. They are complementary. In other words, they're four portraits of one person. And we are getting a fuller picture of who Jesus is. So, for instance, last week we studied Mark. And we saw Mark was the gospel of Jesus as the crucified Messiah King. Now, what's interesting is Matthew is going to give us the same gospel, but very different theological emphasis. What do I mean by that? Well, when we read the gospel of Matthew... The first two chapters of Matthew are not to be found in the Gospel of Mark. That should make us pause for a minute and say, why does Matthew have these chapters and Mark does not have them? Mark doesn't record Jesus' genealogy, his birth, his infancy, his flight to Egypt. Why does Matthew have these details and Mark does not? Complementary portraits telling us something in particular about Jesus. So lastly, for review, a couple facts that show us the Gospels are biography that is theological in nature. The Gospel of John, if you add up all the events in it, remember, only covers 20 days of Jesus' life. If you look at what we often call the Synoptic Gospels, the similar view Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, you add up all the sermons, all the miracles, all the days of Jesus' life, you only get 57 days. In fact, in John's Gospel... Chapters 1 through 11 are a three-year summary of his life, and then 12 to 21, two weeks. 
12 to 21, two weeks. Secondly, something new to say today, Matthew and Mark's relationship. All right, when you read the Gospel of Mark and you compare it to Matthew, you find out that Matthew's content has 95% of Mark inside of it. In other words, exactly what Mark says, 95% of Mark is found in the Gospel of Matthew. In other words, to be very specific, 55% of Mark verbatim, word for word, is found in the Gospel of Matthew. It's kind of like Matthew was a student in middle school and he was kind of leaning over the desk, all right, and he's reading what Mark wrote and he's recording it for us. That is really the case. In fact, of the 662 verses found in Mark, 600 of them are found in Matthew. So again, there's a literary relationship. Why is that important? Well, it's important because it helps us to understand what Matthew is trying to do. It's like Matthew is a fresh edition of Mark, but Matthew has added to Mark some things to give us another portrait of the one same gospel of Jesus Christ. So think of it this way. One way to figure out why Matthew is writing his gospel is to pay attention to what he adds to his gospel that Mark does not have inside of his. So again, Matthew begins with the genealogy of Jesus' life, the birth record of Jesus' life, the virgin birth of Jesus. It begins with the flight of Jesus into Egypt, the wise men coming. None of that is in the Gospel of Mark. Matthew records details at the end of the book. For instance, there was a rumor spread that Jesus' body was stolen by his disciples. That's not recorded in Mark. There is a reason why he tells us that detail. Mark does not. Maybe the biggest thing of all that's different between these two Gospels is the sermons of Jesus. It's pretty amazing. Three-fifths of Matthew's gospel is the words of Jesus, the sermons of Jesus. Way more words of Jesus are in Matthew's gospel than are in Mark's. We should pay attention to that. We should want to think about why that is. So if Mark's theme was Jesus Christ is the crucified Messiah King, what is Matthew's theme? Well, I'm going to propose to you today that Matthew's theme is Jesus is the promised Messiah. Jesus completes the story of Israel for the world. That's a mouthful, but you're going to hear it a bunch today. Jesus is the promised Messiah. Jesus completes the story of Israel for the world. So with that being the case, look with me at Matthew 9, verses 9 through 13. Let's think about who Matthew is and why that's important to his portrait his theological biography of the one gospel of Jesus Christ. Matthew 9, beginning at verse 9. And Jesus went on from there, and he saw a man called Matthew sitting in the tax office, and he said to him, follow me. And he, Matthew, stood up and followed him. Then it happened that as Jesus was reclining at the table in the house, Behold, many tax collectors and sinners came and were dining with Jesus and his disciples. And when the Pharisees saw this, they said to his disciples, Why is your teacher eating with the tax collectors and sinners? But when Jesus heard this, he said, It is not those who are healthy who need a physician, but those who are sick. But go and learn what this means. I desire compassion and not sacrifice. For I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners. I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners. All right. When we read the Gospels, they're not like Paul's letters. They don't begin and say, the Gospel according to Mark. This Gospel was written by the pen of Matthew. They don't say that. They're technically anonymous. But there are details inside of them that help us to know who they are, and church history also helps us to know who the author is. So, just like in Mark's gospel, we saw that little account last week of this young man who is laying in the Garden of Gethsemane, and he only had a blanket over himself, and that was the author Mark. This week, we're going to see the same thing here. Matthew records his own conversion account to Jesus 
in this passage. Now, Matthew is one of the 12 disciples. Mark was not a disciple. Matthew was. And if you look over at chapter 10, there's a list of the disciples. And I want you to notice how Matthew talks about himself. Look at chapter 10, verse 3. It says there, there is Philip and Bartholomew and Thomas and Matthew, the tax collector. Matthew identifies himself in his gospel a certain way. He says, I am the tax collector. Now, why do I bring this up? If you compare this with Mark's gospel and Luke's gospel, it's interesting. The other gospel writers never call him Matthew, the tax collector. You see, Matthew is very humble when he writes about himself. He's not proud. He's not a braggart. Same thing was true in Mark's gospel, right? When Mark records the accounts of Peter, there's nothing good about Peter. Why? Because Peter gave his gospel to Mark. Matthew is very humble in his gospel as he talks about himself. The others just call him Matthew. In fact, in this passage that we're about to think about for a minute here in Matthew 9, when Matthew writes about himself as a tax collector, he calls himself his, his name Matthew, associated with the office of being a tax collector, right? Or excuse me, associated with him being a disciple of Jesus. Let me say that correctly, being a disciple of Jesus. But when Mark and Luke tell the same story, they tell it a little differently. What do I mean by that? Well, in Mark chapter 2, It says Jesus was passing by and he saw Levi, that's the tax collector name of Matthew, sitting in the tax office. Luke does the same thing. Luke says that as Jesus went out, he noticed a tax collector named Levi. The other writers will not call him his Christian name, Matthew, his his birth name, right? They call him his tax collector name when they recount his conversion. In fact, another little detail, Matthew is so humble, he doesn't even tell us that after he got saved, it was his house that he threw the party. Did you notice that? Look again in your Bible at verse 10. It says there, it happened as Jesus was reclining at the table in the house. When you read Matthew's account, you're like, whose house? What table? What's going on here? How did Jesus transport into a house? None of these details are given in Matthew's account. Why? He's humble about himself. He's not bragging. Whereas Mark and Luke are very specific that Jesus was reclining in his, in Levi's house. Or Luke says it even more clearly, and Levi gave a big reception, a big party for Jesus in his house. So who is this man? Matthew, Levi. Matthew, Again, his name is a disciple. His probably his birth name, Levi, his tax collector's name. All right, and again, very common for people to have more than one name in the ancient world. Hence, Mark was John Mark. Matthew is Matthew Levi. Paul, Saul, right? This is a common occurrence in that era of history. So, what's going on here? Well, Matthew has been sitting at a tax booth for many years. He's absorbed in his worldly calling. He's living the good life of the first century. He's wealthy. He's successful. He's got a government job. He's got a steady paycheck. In fact, he is in a position of authority over others. He's working for Herod Antipas, right? He's under contract in one of the last holes inside of Herod's territory, which makes this a very important franchise in Capernaum, about four miles from that city. Understand that Israel had been conquered by the Romans and the locals could buy tax franchises. And every penny they charge extra, they got to keep. And their corruption was enforced by the Roman military. So they could charge whatever they want. And the Roman military was standing there to protect the tax collector. So because of this, tax collectors were known to be a very corrupt group of people. In fact, they were considered traitors to Israel who had compromised their patriotism and compromised the faith of Israel. Alfred Edersheim, the great Jewish scholar, writes in his work that tax collectors were barred from the synagogue. They were not allowed to have any social or religious contact with other Jews. Edersheim says this, he says, Tax collectors were ranked with unclean animals, 
which a Jew must not touch. They were in the same class as swine, and they were forbidden from giving testimony in a court of law. Mark Twain once asked famously, what's the difference between a taxidermist and a tax collector? And Mark Twain said, a taxidermist only takes your skin. Well, those sentiments were very true in the first century as well. Maimonides, the Jewish rabbi, said that every tax collector is a thief. Uh, one Jewish writing says that when the king's tax collectors enter a house to dwell, everyone in the house is defiled. So, Matthew is living his best life now. Levi has a very successful life by the world standards, but he is a religious, social, moral, national outcast. Jesus comes to him, and he says, follow me. Now, again, I want you to see Matthew's humility when he records his own story. When you compare what Matthew says with what Luke says, it just says in Matthew's account, he stood up and he followed Jesus. But look what Luke says. Luke says he left everything behind and rose up and began to follow him. You see, because of his job being a Roman job, he knew that if he walked away from that office, he would never be able to return. He walked away from a career but he gained eternity. He lost material possessions, but he gained a spiritual fortune that will never be stripped from him. How wonderful is this obedience to the call of Christ? No matter what it cost him, he took up the cross and he followed Jesus and became a disciple. Some of you here in this room today, you haven't left anything to follow Jesus. Listen, a religion that doesn't cost you anything isn't worth anything. We are called to not simply be passive followers of Jesus. In fact, passive and follower don't work together, do they? Those two terms are antithetical. We are active if we are followers of Jesus. We must be willing to stand up when everyone else bows down. We must be willing to go forward when everyone else is pulling backwards. That is following Jesus. Like Psalm 119 says, I made haste and I did not delay to keep your commandments. Here in Matthew 9, we see Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep. We see the effectual call of God as Jesus speaks the word and the voice of the Lord is powerful, converting the soul. Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice and they follow me. All he has to do is say the word, and he overcomes the greed, the resistance, the sin, all of the disappointments in Matthew's soul, and at once Matthew is made alive. Now, there's something else unique in Matthew's account that's not found in the other Gospels. Look at verse 13. Matthew quotes the prophet Hosea, chapter 6, verse 6. Mark doesn't, Luke doesn't. Only Matthew gives us these words of Jesus. They must have been spinning in his mind when Jesus said them. It must have knocked his spiritual socks off when he heard Jesus say this passage and apply it to Matthew and all the people who were in the room at that party. Go and learn what this means. I desire compassion and not sacrifice. In Matthew's home, Jesus said these words and he was so changed by them, two times in his gospel he quotes Jesus saying them. The other gospels writers don't. Because they had impacted him so deeply. He tasted mercy for the first time in his life by the Lord Jesus Christ. Listen, true conversion happens at the call of Christ. Matthew wants us to see true conversion for even a religious, national, social, greedy tax-collecting outcasts like himself. Matthew wants us to see there's forgiveness. It's very important. J.C. Ryle has said here that Jesus can take a tax gatherer and make him an apostle. He can change any heart and make all things new. Let us never despair of anyone's salvation. If you're in this room today, Jesus can overcome whatever is keeping you from him. Let us pray on, speak on, work on, in order to do good to souls, even to the souls of the worst kind. When he says, by the power of the Spirit, follow me, 
He can make the hardest and most sinful person obey. Matthew immediately becomes an evangelist telling others about Jesus. Immediately. And by the way, it's so cool what Matthew records this little detail in the next chapter. Look at chapter 10 again. Look at verses 3 and 4 there. He's giving that list of the disciples. He says, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas, Matthew, the tax collector. We already read that. And then he says, James, the son of Alphaeus and Thaddeus. And notice the next name, Simon the Zealot. He also tells us about Simon's former job before he was a Christian. He was a political nationalist. He was a political anti-nationalist. Zealots hated Rome. Zealots were known to carry daggers and murder anyone who worked for the Roman Empire. They were trying to overthrow the Roman Empire. What Matthew is trying to tell us here is, listen, before my conversion and Simon's conversion, it's probably the case that Simon would have tried to murder me. (laughs) And now we're in the same family. The tax collector saved the zealot is saved. We're no more enemies at war. We are reconciled by the power of Jesus Christ. And he takes this man who is looked on by everyone else as the scum of society, and God uses his experience to, remember, what did Matthew do for a living? He kept records. He wrote, right? God uses Matthew, this tax collector, to be a record keeper for the gospel of Jesus Christ, and preserve one of the most detailed accounts of Jesus' words, deeds, and genealogy we have. Think about Matthew. Uh, Some of the other disciples who were professional fishermen, they went back to catching fish for a while. Jesus, when he changed Matthew's life, he never went back to being a tax collector, right? Instead, he used what he was in the past Now, for the glory of God alone. Now, why does this matter to the gospel? For a lot of reasons. I'm glad you asked. A lot of reasons. First off, history. So I showed you some history last week. Uh, First off, um, history outside of the Bible. We read by the church father Papias around the year AD 130 that Matthew was the author of the gospel. He wrote a gospel. That's a record outside of the Bible itself. Irenaeus, the church father, writing about the year 200, says that Matthew issued a written gospel, and he says he wrote it while Peter and Paul were preaching the gospel and founding the church in Rome. Now, Peter and Paul died somewhere between 64 and 67 AD at the hands of Nero. So when was Matthew's gospel written? Assumingly, sometime before 64 to 67 AD, since Uh, He wrote it while they were preaching the gospel in Rome, and of course, he couldn't have wrote it while they were preaching the gospel if they were dead. (laughs) So it was sometime before then he wrote it. And of course, I'm assuming he's copying off Mark. He's using Mark as a starting point, and he's enlarging it. But maybe the greatest testimony comes from the church father, Origen, who says, among the four gospels, which are the only indisputable ones in the church of God under heaven... I have learned by tradition the first was written by Matthew, who was once a tax collector, but afterwards an apostle of Jesus, and it was prepared for the converts from Judaism. So internally, we see Matthew as the author, and same externally. That was the testimony of the early church. So as a former tax collector, there are things unique in Matthew's gospel, not in the others. And I want to point them out. Things we take for granted all the time. Beautiful. Ready? First off, the Lord's Prayer. Now, in Luke's Gospel, in Luke 11, when Luke records the one teaching of Jesus, he says that Jesus said to pray this way, Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. But Matthew's account of the Lord's Prayer is different. Do you notice the language Matthew uses? This would be a very important word to a man who is a tax collector. Lord, forgive us our debts as we have also forgiven our debtors. Isn't that wild? A man who probably never forgave anyone's debts unless they were on the take with him now has tasted what it means 
to have the debt of sin forgiven. And so when he records Jesus' words, he records the account where Jesus says, forgive us our debts. Something he had not done before, but now as a new man in Jesus, he knew what it means to really forgive the vast unpaid debt we owe one another and we owe to God. Matthew also records in Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, a verse Luke does not, in Matthew 6, where, by the way, only here in the, in the New Testament, Jesus says, no one can serve two masters. When Matthew heard this, wow, this must have hit his heart. For either he's going to hate the one and love the other, or be devoted to the one and despise the other. You can't be a slave to two different people, right? You have to have one focus. He says, you cannot serve God and wealth and money and mammon. Matthew understood exactly what that meant because he had spent his whole life serving the God of money. The, the Israeli dream, we call it the American dream, right? He had plenty of shekels, but he had no salvation. And a lot of us have a lot of dollars and we have no redemption. I have no purpose in life. Matthew knew you have to choose this day who you're going to serve. And he records this verse for us. In fact, later in the gospel, he includes verbatim Mark's accounts of Jesus' words for the rich young ruler. When he doesn't take this one out, he keeps this one in his gospel. This story must have been so touching to him that this rich young ruler walks away from Jesus because he loved his money. And the disciples are like, Lord, who can be saved if you have to love God more than riches? And Jesus says, listen, it's not a problem. With men, this is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. You can even have a camel pass through the eye of a needle. <laughs> and that's what's going to happen. The miracle every time someone's a Christian. And by the way, again, Matthew must have loved that verse because no one thought he could ever be saved. He couldn't even walk in the synagogue. They wouldn't let him in. And yet Jesus walks right up to him and says, follow me. When everyone else said, get away from me, Jesus says, follow me. With men, it was impossible. But with God, all things were possible in Matthew's life. He was a changed man. If we had time, we look at Matthew 17, where Matthew records alone Jesus' teaching on paying taxes in Matthew 17, 24 to 27, only in Matthew's gospel. But I want us to look at another one. Turn to Matthew 18, please. Matthew 18. This must have been so personal to this gospel writer. Matthew 18. See, he records alone this account of the parable of the unforgiving servant. How are we to forgive, Jesus? That was the question. Jesus, how do we forgive? We forgive 70 times 7, which means we're a people of forgiveness. As C.S. Lewis said, to be a Christian is to forgive the inexcusable because God has forgiven the inexcusable in you. And that's exactly what we see in Matthew 18. Check this out. Look with me. We'll just start at verse 23 because of time. It says, for this reason, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his slaves. Again, only Matthew records this parable. When the king had begun to settle them, one who owed him 10,000 talents was brought to him. But since he did not have the means to repay, his Lord commanded him to be sold along with his wife and children and all he had and repayment to be made. Therefore, the slave fell to the ground and was prostrating himself before the king, saying, Have patience with me, and I will repay you everything. And feeling compassion, the Lord of that slave released him and forgave him the debt. But, all right, this is where it must have got so personal. That slave went out and found one of his fellow slaves who owed him 100 denarii, 100 days worth of work one-fourth of what you make a whole year. And he seized him and began to choke him, saying, pay back what you owe. Matthew must have had his life flash before him when he read those words, when he heard those words from Jesus. He must have recalled some behind-the-tax-booth meetings he had with the Roman centurion in his district. And sometimes his hands might have been on the throat 
of someone who was not paying that money. I'm going to throw you in jail if you don't pay the tax. I'm going to have your family taken from you. Matthew was an extortioner. Tax collectors were greedy extortioners. But notice what Jesus continues to say. So his fellow slave fell to the ground and was pleading with him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will repay you. But he was unwilling and went and threw him in prison until he should pay back what he owed. So when his fellow slaves saw what had happened, they were deeply grieved and came and reported to their Lord all that had happened. Then summoning him, his Lord said, You wicked slave, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. Should you not also have had mercy on your fellow slave in the same way that I had mercy on you? And his Lord, moved with anger, handed him over to the torturers until you would repay all that was owed him. And my heavenly Father will do the same to you if each of you does not forgive his brother from your hearts. In his former life, he acted out the role of verse 28, that servant. But no more. He knew what forgiveness was. His gospel's all about forgiveness because he's a man who's tasted of that very forgiveness. So, why was Matthew's gospel written? That's the question as we close these last 10 minutes. Why? Well, Matthew's theme, I believe, is Jesus is the promised Messiah. Jesus completes the story of Israel for the world. Mark's theme is Jesus is the crucified Messiah King. He's a suffering servant for us. But I think Matthew's theme is Jesus is the promised Messiah completing the story of Israel for the world. As this new movement called Christianity was spreading throughout the Roman Empire, Christians were being persecuted. You remember what Saul did in the book of Acts. They were being expelled from the synagogues. They were being locked up and imprisoned for their faith. They were being told not to come to the temple in Jerusalem. Christians were called heretics because they were followers of the Messiah, the way. Rabbinic Judaism, which was a deplorable perversion of the faith of Israel of old, rejected Jesus as the Messiah. And that became the consensus of the Jewish movement. So what do religious Jews do with these followers of Jesus who they claim is the Messiah? Well, Matthew is speaking directly to them and to the brand new church to answer that question. Imagine a group of early Christians. They have been booted out of the synagogue. They can't gather there anymore. They've lost their support from their family and friends in the synagogue. They're huddled together for worship. It's been about 20 years since Jesus died and rose again. And they are listening eagerly as one of the original followers of Jesus, Matthew, has written their church a gospel message to help us answer the question why we should keep believing Jesus is the promised Messiah and why it's a good thing that Gentiles, non-Jews, are coming into our churches. In fact, this isn't plan B. This was plan A for the beginning. Jesus completes the story of Israel, not just for ethnic Jews, but for the peoples in the world. This new Christian community is the completion of the story of Israel of old, authorized by the Hebrew scriptures. This is an apology, a defense for the watching world that Jesus really is who he said he is. He is the Christ. He is the Messiah. Here's a couple details for you. In the Gospel of Matthew, there are 129 allusions from the Old Testament showing Jesus is the Messiah. That's a lot. But even more, there are 60 direct quotes from the Old Testament, referring to passages showing us Jesus is the Messiah. Turn back to Matthew chapter 1 with me. I want you to see this. Sixty times Matthew says, let me explain and show you that Jesus is the promised Messiah. Don't listen to Second Temple Judaism, Rabbinic Judaism. They are denying what was plain and obvious before us. We beheld the glory of Jesus as the Messiah. He completes the story of Israel. He is the promised one. 
He is doing exactly what the God of Israel said he was going to do. 17 times Matthew says, it is fulfilled. This fulfills. Christians, these new believers, they are the real Israel. They don't have to get rid of their Old Testament Jewishness. No, in fact, the reality is they are completing what the Old Testament said was the truth. And Gentiles don't have to Judaize. They don't have to follow the Pharisees and their man-made laws. They don't need the temple. Jesus is our temple. They don't need the sacrifices. Jesus is our sacrifice. They don't need circumcision. God circumcises their hearts. Jesus changes and completes everything. One of the clearest examples of the 60, right in the beginning, Matthew 1, verse 23. Now, all this took place, that is the birth of Jesus, in order that what was spoken by the Lord through the prophet would be fulfilled. Behold, the virgin will conceive, right? She will be with child and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel. This is a direct, one of the direct quotes from Isaiah 7, verse 14. And then Matthew says, which translated from Hebrew means God with us. Which shows us he's not just writing to Jews. Jews would know what Emmanuel means. He's also writing to these new Christians that are Gentiles coming into the church. And he's saying, look, Jesus completes the story of Isaiah 700 years earlier. Jesus completes the story for the world. Jesus is the Messiah. Rabbinic Judaism is wrong. This book, when you read it, you're going to see sharp contrast between the faith of the Pharisees. You go read Matthew 23. That's some homework for later. Look at the faith of the Pharisees compared to the faith of God. Go read the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5 to 7, and Jesus shows us the real meaning of the law, not the meaning of the law that the religious elites of his day had corrupted it to. Matthew's gospel makes a big deal about the Sadducees. John's doesn't because it's written later. They don't exist. But he is saying in his day, listen, what the Pharisees and the Sadducees have done is not in accord with the prophecies of the Old Testament. They are a leaven that must be avoided at all costs. In fact, he makes a big deal about Jesus as the son of David. Ten times in his gospel. Look with me at chapter 1. See how the book begins, Matthew 1, as we close. Look there. Matthew 1, verses 1 through 6. I know, like, you don't end a sermon with a genealogy, but actually, this is the high point. Ready? The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, who is the son of David, who is the son of Abraham. David and Abraham are the starting point For Jesus' story. Jesus completes the story of Israel for the world. Jesus is the promised Messiah. Now there's a bunch of names here. Ready? Abraham fathered Isaac. Isaac, Jacob. Jacob, Judah, and his brothers. Judah was the father of Perez and Zerah by, pay attention, Tamar. More on that in a minute. Perez was the father of Hezron. Hezron, Ram. Ram, Aminadab. Aminadab, Nashon. Nashon, Salmon. Salmon, the father of Boaz by Rahab. Pay attention to that. Boaz, the father of Obed by Ruth. Pay attention to that name. Obed, Jesse. Jesse, David the king. David, father of Solomon. By the wife of Uriah. Pay attention to that. The wife of Uriah. Jacob, skipping down, verse 16. Jacob, the father of Joseph, husband of Mary. Notice, it doesn't say Joseph is the father of Jesus. It says, Joseph, the husband of Mary, by whom Jesus was born, who is called Messiah. Therefore, all the generations from Abraham to David are 14. David to the deportation to Babylon, 14. The deportation to Babylon to Christ, 14. Don't take the first 17 verses of Matthew's gospel for granted. These are not in Mark's gospel. They are setting the theme. Jesus completes the story of Israel of old. These thousands of years of human history were all pointing forward to this moment. Jesus is 
the promised Messiah. God broke into the world 2,000 years ago, friends, and he did it in Jesus, the Messiah, who came as the son of David and the son of Abraham, fulfilling all the promises of old. God is using Matthew's gifting as a bean counter to give us this detailed genealogy. A former accountant and tax man, God uses our gifting. Here's what I'm going to say to you. If you are noticing gaps in the church, that might mean that's your gifting. What am I saying? If you look around the church every Sunday and you see everyone looks defeated, hurting, hurting, beaten down, you may have the gift of encouragement. Use it. If you look around and no one seems excited about evangelism and missions and sharing the gospel, that might be your gift. Share it with others. If you come to church on Sunday and you're like, man, this place is organized chaos, you might have the gift of administration and leadership. Use what God has DNA'd in you. God gifted Matthew this way, and look what he writes, these beautiful words. By the way, it goes back to Abraham, right? Jesus is the promised Messiah that completes the story of Israel. What was the promise to Abraham? Genesis 12, and multiple places elsewhere. Abraham, in you, who's going to be blessed? All the nations of the world are going to be blessed. Are you ready? That's important. Matthew gives this genealogy, and it's really shocking. When you read this genealogy, he includes women. That's unheard of in the ancient world. And you know who he does not include? He does not include the women we would expect him to share. He doesn't share with us women that, like Sarah or Rebecca, these great matriarchs of the story of Israel. He includes scandalous Gentile women, women of the nations of the world who are not picture perfect, women who are just like Matthew, Tamar, Genesis 38. How does she get in the bloodline of Jesus the Messiah? She gets in it by disguising herself as a prostitute and seducing her father-in-law, Judah. That's supposed to make your stomach turn. It's, it's horrible. God has her in the genealogy. And then Rahab. Rahab didn't have to disguise herself as a prostitute. She was a prostitute. And a Canaanite on top of that, a Gentile. And yet, she marries a man named Salmon, not just a fish, but a descendant of King David, the great, great grandmother of him. And then you got Ruth, a Gentile Moabitess woman. And we look at Ruth and we say, wow, she was impeccable. She worshipped the god Chemosh. Ruth has a questionable scene where she goes in at night and lays. Now, I'm not saying anything bad happened, but it's questionable. She goes in and lays at the feet of Boaz and puts her, her reputation on the line. She's a foreigner, scandalous to the Jews. She's in the line of Jesus. And then we get in verse 6, the wife of Uriah, who is Bathsheba. Another scandalous woman, adultery, right? Adultery takes place. Maybe David was preying on her and using his power, but definitely adultery for sure. We would expect Sarah and Rebecca and Leah and Rachel, but no, Jesus came through the line of Abraham, so all the nations of the world would be blessed, and he uses sinful people that are forgiven people like Tamar and Rahab and Ruth and Bathsheba and even old Matthew himself. If God was at work in the past under these circumstances, God is at work in the present in the same circumstances of sinful, adulterous, idolaters, people with dirty pasts who have a great future when they bow the knee to Jesus Christ as Lord. Jesus is the promised Messiah. He completes the story for Israel, for the world. Now look, I should be done already. I'm out of time. My watch stopped. But I got one more point I've got to make. And I'm preaching 28 chapters, so really, you should expect to leave here by time to go to work tomorrow morning, honestly. So just feel like this is all grace from this point on, all right? 
Jesus is the promised Messiah who completes the story of Israel for the world. Prove it, you say. All right, you didn't get it in chapter 1. Chapter 2 is not in Mark either. What happens in chapter 2? Again, fulfilling Old Testament prophecy. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, magi from the east arrived in Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? We saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. It's not the religious Jews in Jerusalem who worship. It's pagan magi, maybe from Babylon. It's the first story of those who worship Jesus. Astrologers, magi, not the religious elite. Jesus is the promised Messiah who completes the story of Israel for prostitutes and tax collectors and astrologers from Babylon or wherever in the east, right? And then, how does the gospel end? It's a bookend. Jesus tells his disciples the final words of the risen Christ. I want you to go now and make disciples of who? Pagan, magi, and prostitutes, and tax collectors, not just ethnic Israel, even all the way in Pensacola, Florida, there's some people that need to be saved. <laughs> in our city, in Escambia and Santa Rosa County, in our counties, go make disciples of them. Jesus completes the story of Israel. One more thing, can't, can't miss this, theological biography. Matthew does something in his gospel that's so cool. When we read historical accounts, we need to pay attention to the details that are recorded. Jesus completes the story of Israel. Are you ready? Matthew's account has that powerful Sermon on the Mount, not found in Mark's gospel, right? Matthew 5 to 7. Where does Jesus do, give this exposition of the law? On a mountain, right? Have you ever thought how Jesus completes the story of Israel of old? Matthew is all about mountains. Think with me for a minute. In the temptation of Jesus, he's taken up to a mountain. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus speaks with authority, saying, I didn't come to destroy the law, I came to fulfill the law on a mountain. Jesus is transfigured on a mountain. The final sermon of Jesus is on a mountain. Jesus is betrayed on a mountain. The great commission of Matthew 28 is on a mountain. It's almost like God always meets with his people on a mountain in the Old Testament, and Jesus meets with his people over and over again on a mountain in the Gospel of Matthew. He completes the story of Israel for the world. He is God who has come. And by the way, how would this all encourage Christians? Well, Christians are being kicked out of the synagogue. At the beginning of Matthew's gospel, we have this wicked uh, puppet king, Herod, trying to kill the infants of Bethlehem. Then we have the wicked Roman leaders and the wicked religious Jews trying to kill Jesus and put him to death, plotting against him. And what's so amazing I think this encourages the first church and encourages us today as Matthew begins and ends with a very important theme. And that is that in the worst suffering, thrown out of the synagogue, rejected by the Jewish leaders, attacked by the authorities, Jesus having to flee to Egypt, right? God is with his people in Jesus Christ. You're not on your own. How's the book begin? Matthew 1. His name will be Emmanuel, which is what? God with us. Matthew 16, I'm building my church. The gates of hell ain't prevailing against it. Matthew 28, hey church, I'm going to be with you always to the very end of this age. See, you're not on your own church. Matthew knew that. Jesus might have ascended to heaven, but Jesus was very much with Matthew and with everyone who turns to him and becomes his disciple and his follower. Jesus is the promised Messiah who completes the story of Israel for the word, the world. That is the gospel of Matthew. Let's pray. Mm -hmm.